Okay, let's uh, get started on, on our second panel. And I will, uh, I'd like to introduce Fred Berkston, who I think all of you uh, know, Senior Fellow and Director Emeritus at uh, Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, the think tank that he founded and is one of the most, uh, the premier economic trade financial institute in the world, I think. Fred? Dan, thanks very much for the invitation and the uh, opportunity to chair this panel on this very important topic. Um, the first panel looked at the series of papers and I think were excellent and, uh, and generate a good discussion, though maybe we didn't have enough time for it. Um, now we'll maybe have a little more time after we hear the views of the three panelists who are leading off. Uh, all of them are very experienced on the topic and we'll have, I think, some interesting views to consider as we talk further about the role and future of the Asian in in Infrastructure Investment Bank, U.S. attitudes toward it, Japanese attitudes toward it, and that whole set of issues. So, without further ado, um, Matt Goodman will speak first. Uh, to my right, I'll just go down the, the row. Uh, he is now at, um, at CSIS. Uh, and was the key guy on international economic policy uh, in the White House for an extended period, working at the National Security Council and simultaneously National Economic Council, if I understand the system right. Okay. And then in the cleanup slot, uh, David Dollar, uh, one of the most experienced and knowledgeable U.S. experts, or indeed experts anywhere in the world, on the Chinese economy. Uh, David is now at the Thornton Center at Brookings, he had been the Treasury's emissary in Beijing for four years. Prior to that, uh, he had previously spent a very distinguished career in the World Bank uh, on China, but prior to that, as one of the most uh, eminent researchers in the research department on trade issues, globalization more broadly, as well as China and Asia. So it's a super panel, and let me turn first to Matt to get us going. Okay, thank you, Fred, and thanks, uh, Dan and, and Slesko Peace Foundation for uh, organizing this and inviting me to uh, participate. Um, first of all, this is, I think, for sure the most uh, intimidating panel that I've sat on this week, so uh, so it's a tall order here. Have some sympathy uh, for those of us who uh, have to compete with the, uh, the brain power up here. Um, also, uh, another caveat, I'm supposed to mainly comment, I think, on Tobias's paper and the U.S. Uh, um, response to the AIB. Uh, and I'll do that, but, but I also thought the other two papers were really excellent, and I'd like to say a few things about that, um, and also picking up on some of the earlier discussion. Another just framing point or a caveat at the beginning, I mean, I think uh, the AIB is important and interesting and worth studying. I, I do think a little too much has been made about it um, in the scheme of things uh, here in D.C. and in, uh, maybe in Beijing as well. Uh, and uh, I think the broader context of all this is more interesting than the individual bank, but I'll play along here because I do think it's, I, I do think there's some interesting questions that arise out of the AIB um, situation. So first, in terms of the U.S. response, um, I, I guess let me just say for the record that the, U, the way the U.S. handled this, I, I'm not sure that I, I haven't been doing this for 50 years, so I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, deign to um, uh, endorse um, Fred's view on this, but I would say that um, that the response from the U.S. was somewhere on the spectrum between disappointing and, and disastrous, I would say. Um, and so, uh, so let me just get that on the record. Um, I, I do not think it was motivated by some kind of strategic um, thinking about stopping China. Uh, yes, there are concerns growing in parts of the U.S. government about Chinese assertive behavior uh, in various uh, fields, particularly in the South China Sea and, and so forth. Um, and yes, certainly that uh, famous, infamous uh, Financial Times article in, in March of, um, of this year uh, that talked about you know, constant accommodation of China sort of suggested there was a bigger, a bigger concern. But I actually think that the real problem here in the way the U.S. responded was there was too little kind of strategic thinking uh, brought to this subject. And it was, it was really because it was viewed so narrowly that I think this became a problem, not because it was somehow seen as a, as a great um, a major challenge to the U.S. position. Um, I, I also think that um, that this was more a failure of public relations than it was a failure of policy. Uh, 
And, and I particularly say that for a couple of reasons. One, because I think some of the policy questions that the U.S. had were legitimate. They were questions about, you know, how you should, um, uh, whether uh, you need a new institution to, uh, to deal with uh, infrastructure problems. Uh, if so, you know, how it should be governed, how it should lend, how it should procure, and so forth. So I think that there were some real po policy questions here. Um, and I also think, per the discussion in the last panel, and as, as Yun Sun so um, eloquently highlighted, uh, you know, the fact is that, that China has moved in uh, a policy direction uh, that, that I think is towards uh, the U.S. Um, interest in all of this. Whether that's come at a huge price or not, I mean, is another question. But in terms of the actual policy uh, movement here on this issue, it's actually been uh, in line with U.S. interests. So, uh, so I, I think this is less of a failure. Plus, plus, as I say, I don't think this is such a big deal in the scheme of things. But I think it was clearly a, a PR disaster. Uh, so that's, there's no question there. I think in terms of what happened, uh, I, I, you know, I think Tobias has captured a lot of it, although, I, again, I think, I think what happened initially was there was too little attention, as he said, to this issue when it was first talked about in the fall of 2013 and even into 2014. Uh, nobody was really paying attention. There, were, uh, there was not a sense of exactly what China wanted to do. Again, as, as somebody, I think to, uh, Tobias mentioned, there was not a lot of information provided by China. So I think the, the U.S. government officials dealing with this didn't really focus. Uh, there, there was a lack of ownership in the U.S. government, um, even at the U.S. Treasury. Uh, I don't know, the, the calendar sort of matters here. Lael Brainerd, the undersecretary, had left the Treasury at the end of 2013. And there was no uh, undersecretary uh, appointed, Nathan Sheets, until September of uh, 2014. And so I think there was a little bit of lack of adult supervision um, at, at Treasury. Um, and, you know, but I think more broadly, this issue was handled more by competent, you know, officials in, in the uh, bureaucracy uh, who were, I think, trying to do their best on a set of specific issues, uh, but not necessarily enough kind of high level attention and thought to. Uh, the broader uh, broader implications of this. Um, I, I think, you know, stepping back from it, to me, the, the big mistakes, and, and Tobias definitely highlighted one of them, uh, were, the, um, were the failure to articulate earlier on a sort of principled position on this institution. And if I were doing this, and maybe it's easy from the outside or in hindsight, but I think, I think what I would have liked the U.S. government to have done uh, earlier on, a year ago at least, was to put out a statement that said, I mean, essentially what is, is now being said, which is that agree with China that there's a large infrastructure need in, in the Asia Pacific, uh, uh, agree that China has a lot to bring to the table uh, to deal with that issue, um, uh, you know, but do we need a new bureaucracy? And I would have called it that, you know, to just get that line down. Um, I would have said, you know, if, if a new institution, how should it be governed, you know, how should it land, and so forth, and put out the sort of principles behind this. And then I think you would have been on the higher moral ground. You would have been able to, you know, not indicate, not suggest that you were somehow blocking this, but you were just asking some legitimate questions. So I think that was one big mistake, was the failure to articulate that publicly earlier. Um, and, then, and then I think the other problem, which is something that, you know, um, is a broader challenge for the U.S. government is I think we really underestimated the, the, the softness, some would say fecklessness, of, um, of our friends across the pond, uh, particularly in Britain. And, you know, I've got a British passport, so I think I'm allowed to say this. Uh, you know, Britain for 200 years has been feckless towards China, selling drugs and, 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 uh, and, and now uh, <laughs> trying to sell London as a financial center. So wh why we should have been surprised that Britain would ultimately um, uh, cave on this uh, surprises uh, me, at least. And so I think we should have been, uh, I think we should have had better antennae uh, out about what the British would do at a political level. I think part of the problem, again, this is one of the sort of interesting sidelines from my uh, looking into this, is that I think at the staff level, there was actually quite a lot of agreement among the G7 um, officials dealing with this. I think even HM Tre uh, Her Majesty's Treasury uh, officials shared some of the same concerns or questions that the U.S. Treasury, you know, keepers of the tablets also had. Um, but they themselves, I think, didn't sort of anticipate that their political bosses would come in and, and, um, and overrule them. Um, and then obviously the, the final big mistake was that FT article, which I think then elevated this and made it seem as though this was a much bigger sort of strategic uh, pushback. Uh, than it, I think, really was. And I think it's interesting, it would be really interesting to know who actually made that call uh, to Jeff Dyer, because 
um, because I think uh, my sense is it was probably not a Treasury person. It was probably somebody more concerned about uh, sort of geostrategic, geopolitical issues. Um, and those might not have been so much China problems. It might have been somebody who's very frustrated with the British for other reasons and, and felt that, you know, this was just another example of Britain being feckless. So um, I think that's a, but it was clearly a, 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 a terrible mistake and, and elevated this um, uh, dramatically. Um, anyway, I think this whole thing obviously has been a wake-up call and there are a lot of lessons learned and I think, um, I think some of the things that um, Tobias pointed to are, are, are fair uh, comments and lessons and I'm going to come back to that. But I do want to just talk about, uh, for a minute, about the, 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 the papers that uh, Kawai San and, um, and Yun Sun wrote, which we've had the benefit of reading. I'm sorry the rest of you haven't, but they're very good and I, I do encourage you to read them when, they, when they're out. Um, and, um, and particularly, I think both of them framed the questions about China's motivations in a similar way. Uh, Kawai Sun had four points and, and Yun Sun I think had six, but they were really, four, they could be consolidated in a similar way. And I also, when I talk about this, I also talk about those four, uh, those four motivations. Uh, now look, in, in, in this sort of thing in international relations, it's very hard to divine intentions of, you know, even your own policy le makers, let alone uh, those in other countries. I think we tend to, you know, it's more pr productive to look at, you know, real actions and, and the impact of those actions. Um, but I do, I do think looking at these motivations um, and intentions are instructive about the AIB's impact and, again, about future possible moves by, by China. So I do think it was useful for uh, both uh, authors to look into those issues. And um, uh, it's very tempting at this point to say something about the road to hell being paved with good intentions, but I will, uh, in an infrastructure-related conference, sorry, couldn't resist. Um, uh, um, and, and I think in particular because it's, it's worth asking these questions because frankly, you know, China is different. Okay, it's different in at least three ways. It's big. I mean, it's bigger than anybody in the world other than arguably, well, factually, than India. Uh, it's four times bigger than anyone else. So I think the fact that China is so big by itself matters. Uh, China is new to this game of governance in uh, these sorts of institutions. So I think that makes it uh, different and significant. And thirdly, let's face it, you know, China's political system, a one-party state, you know, with an authoritarian system means that I think we have to look at China's actions and, and intentions in a, in a somewhat different way. So I think it is worth looking at those things. I have a similar, as I say, list of, of four things which I call the kind of the intentions behind this, the altruistic, the psychological, the economic, and the geopolitical. Um, and I, I say altruistic a little sarcastically, and that's maybe unfair, but um, but I think there is the question of closing the infrastructure gap, um, you know, s serving international public goods or providing international public goods. It clearly was a motivation here, and uh, I, I think that was definitely part of the calculation. I guess my, it, it, my question in this area are uh, really not so much about that intention, but about whether we really are talking about the right thing. So, we talk about an infrastructure gap, and I have no reason to dispute the ADB numbers of $8 trillion over this decade, but is this really a financing problem? Is the problem that we need more money, or is the problem that there are other things that are obstacles to infrastructure investment that make it very hard to get this money uh, you know, out and investing? So that, you know, in, as Yun Sun said, I think these are infrastructure investment is long-term, the returns are low or uncertain, you know, this political instability you have to deal with in these, in these places that you're uh, trying to invest, lack of um, technical capacity, there are land rights issues and legal issues about investing in infrastructure, uh, there's corruption, there's social and environmental impact questions that have to be cut through to do this investment. So there's a big set of questions about whether there are actually a lot of bankable, enough bankable projects. So putting more money into the, you know, into the water glass when it's already full and it just overflows, I wonder whether that's really going to solve the problem. So, so that to me is a, is a question that kind of arises from this question of providing this public good. Um, and, and then frankly, there's China's track record. I mean, whether, um, you know, whether we're talking about, um, you know, there are lots of examples that are out there in Myanmar and Nicaragua with the new uh, canal or within China, north-south water diversion projects and the Three Gorges Dam and so forth, where I think there were, there, there's enough of a track record that questions about whether, how China is going to behave when it uh, enters into this business, um, I think are legitimate questions. 
the test will be if this new bank does address the, those questions and China's um, uh, uh, track record improves. Now, that is the ha glass half full part of this story, and that, that, in fact, it may have been part of the intention of China to discipline itself to do better because it wasn't getting uh, the kind of returns in all senses of the term that it wanted from its, its um, uh, bilateral practices. So, um, so I think that will, be, that will be the test. You know, psychologically, and this is an important point, my, my second point about the motivation is that, um, you know, as, as Kawai san said, there's dissatisfaction with the current international financial architecture, and that's certainly true. Um, and, um, you know, China is big and, and should have more voice. The West has failed to follow through on a lot of the reforms, particularly, um, you know, the IMF reforms and so forth. Um, but a lot of the, uh, the Chinese motivation seems to be more sort of form-related than substantive. And it has to do more with the sort of pecking order rather than the order, the, the, the international financial order. And um, yes, there's been some proposals for limited substantive reforms that you see in the uh, Asian Infrastructure Bank, uh, like the non-resident board, um, you know, perhaps a democratization of the, of the decision-making process um, and, and moving faster. But those all sort of raise their own questions, which we can go into. Um, I, I guess my fundamental point is that I have uh, a, a, a yet to see a, a compelling argument from China that the substance of the existing international financial order is fundamentally broken. Yes, the setting of the table, perhaps, and uh, China's ability to have voice, but, but the substance of, of what the IMF does or the, or the World Bank does, um, I think those are fairly limited. There have been limited arguments at the margins of these things, but not fundamentally. Um, uh, not supposed to advertise other think tanks stuff, but uh, the Atlantic Council, uh, authored by um, Olin Wethington and Robert Manning put out a very good report a few weeks ago, Shaping the Asia-Pacific Future, which really makes this point that the, the order basically is, in, is not that bad. And uh, the question is, how do we accommodate China's interests here? Um, I won't go into the other two motivations, economic and geopolitical. I think those have been, those have been well covered. So let me just say one thing, a couple of points about the U.S. response, and then, um, and then I, will, uh, I will defer to Michael. Um, so, look, I think the way the U.S. should have responded and should move forward on these sorts of issues um, is essentially not to um, raise the Brits again or give them credit, but I think keep calm and carry on would be, I think, my, uh, my slogan for the U.S. In other words, the U.S. should continue to do what it does well, which is to grow, first of all. And uh, you know, as long as we're a big economy that's growing and we're investing in you know, future growth, infrastructure, education, so forth, um, continuing to um, uh, channel the, the attractive elements of our economy, our higher education system, our ability to innovate, immigration, all that stuff. I mean, that's where it starts, I think. If we do that stuff, we're in good, we're, we're in a, we've got a very strong hand. We should continue to support an open rules-based order um, while willing to adapt that order. In other words, we should both clean the bathwater uh, out of the bath, but also remember there's a baby in there which we help to give birth to and that we championed and that we should, um, we should still protect and defend. And then we just need to be smarter in the way we execute our par policy. We don't have a lot of budgetary resources to put behind this, although Michael's maybe going to tell us there's new money in Congress for these activities. Um, but I do think we can do a lot of things without money that are a lot smarter than what we did here. Uh, and I would say just to, you know, cut to the chase, TPP is an example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, of, of a smarter type of policy that creates, uh, uh, advances and moves forward the, the rules-based order in a way that incentivizes others to want to follow us. And so I think that's the kind of thing we should look for. And then I've got lots of ideas for reorganizing the U.S. government and getting ourselves uh, in better shape, which involve the way the NSC runs. The state, our State Department needs to be overhauled in this area and make an actual value-added contribution to international economic policy. Um, and then the, my former colleagues at Treasury need to understand that it's not enough to be right. You also need to be persuasive. And I don't think they were, they were that in this case. So I will stop there. Uh, we turn to David Dollar. David has been involved in some of the thinking about the Asian bank. Uh, as I mentioned, he has experience in both uh, China and the World Bank and the Treasury are deep. So David? Give us your perspective. Okay, Th uh, thank you very much. As Fred says, I've had some modest involvement in the creation of AIB. Uh, so for this panel, I was asked to give some insight into the creation. Uh, 
and then also talk about potential relations between the Asian Infrastructure Bank and the World Bank, my former employer. So I'd like to introduce four points into the discussion. The first point concerns the Chinese Secretariat that has been developing AIB, Jin Li Chun and his staff. Most of these staff have come out of the Ministry of Finance of China and also the planning agency, NDRC. All of them have literally decades of experience working together with the World Bank. So these are people who've worked very closely together with the World Bank, and it's generally been quite a positive relationship. China's been one of the largest borrowers. Many people don't realize it continues to be a large borrow. It's actually increased its borrowing in the last couple of years as it's been developing AIB. Uh, it's borrowing now, it's developing some interesting activities focused on reducing air pollution in Chinese cities, for example. Now, as that secretariat got to work last year, uh, they invited eight different retired World Bank staff to advise them on issues of governance, the articles of agreement, procurement, environment, social standards. If the articles of agreement look familiar, it's because largely they were drafted by two retired World Bank lawyers. Now at the end, and I wouldn't want to exaggerate the influence of this group, including myself. Basically, we've been giving advice to AIB. So I think the substantive point is I think it's interesting that the Secretariat turned to experienced international staff, seven out of eight happen to be American citizens, by the way, uh, in order to hear you know, ab you know, about uh, different types of standards. Fred asked at the end of the first panel, you, know, you pointed out, Fred, that some developed countries joined and the US and Japan stayed out. Who had more influence? My answer to that question is I don't think the US and Japan had much influence by staying out. I think the Secretariat was developing quite good governance standards all along, and the European countries joining kind of ratified that process. You know, because again, the Secretariat is fighting all kinds of bureaucratic infights in China. The fact that they develop nice things on paper doesn't mean they're going to be implemented. Uh, but then when the European countries join, Australia, South Korea, New Zealand, you know, I definitely think that that helped lock in uh, the desire of the Secretariat you know, to have standards and governance which on paper look very similar to the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. So that's my first point. Now the second point, while China's had a very good relationship with the World Bank, I don't want to exaggerate that. China was not completely happy with the World Bank. And China increasingly has become an advocate for reform of the World Bank, the IMF, and international financial institutions in general. And Matt pointed out a lot of that is just about voting shares. You know, China feels underrepresented in the World Bank and the IMF and the Asian Development Bank, and it, and it definitely is. But I think a slight disagreement I have with Matt is I think there's some substance behind that. But if you ask the Chinese what they would do with a much bigger share within the World Bank, it's not revolutionary change, but they have a clear answer. They've been a voice for years that the World Bank should focus more on growth and on infrastructure, stick to core businesses, not get distracted into a wide range of, of uh, global public goods. So the Chinese have advocated for reform inside the World Bank, the IMF, et cetera, and, and frankly, they feel somewhat frustrated that they haven't really gotten very far with that reform agenda. Now, it's interesting, a few years ago, there was a high-level commission set up to review the governance of the World Bank. It was chaired by Ernesto Zedillo, the former president of Mexico, and it included some very uh, leading intellectuals from the developing world, Joshua Chuan from China, Arminio Fraga, uh, Montek Alawalia, and then, of course, lots of representatives from the developed world as well. And if you look at the recommendations of the Zedillo report, it's a you know, template for reforming the governance of the World Bank and other multilateral banks in this era. So what did it recommend? It recommended eliminating the resident board, which costs $70 million a year, throws a lot of sand in the wheel. It's not particularly defensible in a modern age of, of uh, easy telecommunication and flight. Um, it recommended that the World Bank get back into infrastructure. It recommended delegating all the loan decisions to management. Uh, and basically, it criticized the World Bank for having become so risk averse that most clients don't go to the World Bank for, world, for uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, because in balancing the risks, some of these environmental and social risks, and I view that you're balancing against that 
the, that against the risk of what happens if you don't do the project, right? What happens if the country doesn't grow, right? So there's a risk that countries don't grow, that people remain poor, that there's hunger. So developing countries are balancing that, and they feel that the World Bank and uh, other multilateral banks have gone overboard in putting all the emphasis on not taking any environmental or social risks. So there's a legitimate argument you know, to be had about wh where you draw the line in balancing those different risks. That Zidio report you know, came down in favor of the World Bank taking more risks uh, and financing more infrastructure projects. So I think one thing that's been missed in a lot of the discussion of AIB, in fact, in fact, Tobias made this point in the first panel, the developed countries joining in many ways wasn't the interesting moment. It was all the ASEAN countries joining on bloc and India joining. So I think what people have missed is developing countries feel quite a bit of anger at the management of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. They feel that these have become bureaucratic and slow and overly focused on certain types of risks that rich countries care about, uh, but they're not really adequately addressing the need of poor countries. So what I see is developing countries, even ones with very difficult relations with China, quickly jumped in and joined this initiative. You know, they think they need long-term capital. You know, M Michael raised an interesting point. We can argue about this, but they think they need long-term capital at reasonable interest rates, uh, and they think they can get it in a less bureaucratic way than they're getting it uh, from World Bank and Asian Development Bank. Now, my third point is that I think we already see some positive effect of AIB on the existing multilateral institutions. So I don't see AIB challenging the existing order. I see it reforming the existing order at the margin, because as I said, on, on, you know, a lot of the governance looks very similar to the existing development banks, and the safeguards are gonna look very similar on paper. You know, how you actually implement them on the ground is gonna be the key issue. But I think we see Asian Development Bank, World Bank, you know, already talking more about financing infrastructure and new initiatives to try to streamline them. You would have to think those existing banks were perfect uh, in order to feel that setting up a whole new institution was a threat to the system. And while I'm a big fan of the World Bank, I don't think it's anywhere close to perfect. And so I welcome AIB uh, as an interesting new innovation that was already challenging the World Bank. And you know, I, I predict we get positive interaction They'll almost certainly be co-financing. The only way AIB can get going quickly would be to co-finance some projects with some, one of one of the existing banks. Uh, and I think we'll see positive competition between the two, the, the group uh, over time. So, so I'm optimistic. China has a huge stake in making this successful. So AIB continues to have a huge stake in learning positive lessons from the existing bank. I'm sure they're gonna start recruiting staff I've got, still got friends in the World Bank who've been asking me, when is AIB going to post jobs? Uh, so I think they'll be able to poach some good staff, and, and I think that's perfectly fair in today's world. Uh, and so I think they'll probably have a positive effect. So I see it augmenting the existing order in a positive way, you know, but, but recognizing that there are risks, and, and you know, we can look at this and come back in a few years and decide who was right. And fourth point I can just make very briefly, it's quite a different point, but having heard several people bring up the issue of overcapacity, you know, I do wanna point out that there's no way that AIB can have any measurable impact on China's excess capacity. You know, AIB is simply too small. China's already very, very large trade surplus would have to grow enormously for there to be any macroeconomic effect. So I'm happy that the AIB Secretariat hasn't been talking about this, uh, certainly not for a long time, and the discussion in China, you know, seems to have changed. That you know, people realize that this is not uh, not a solution for China's domestic capacity problems. The AIB is not a substitute for domestic economic reform in China. So I hope China continues to pursue its reform. That's a completely different topic, uh, but I don't think that AIB will have any measurable effect solving that excess capacity problem. David, thank you and thank all the speakers. Uh, Dan asked me to offer a few comments of my own, so I'll yield myself just a couple of minutes, less time than the others, in order to do that. And just make three or four quick points. Um, the overarching issue here, of course, is not whether we need a few more billion dollars to finance a little more infrastructure in Asia, but rather what this implies for the global uh, economic architecture. 
the United States has repeatedly asked China to take a leadership role. It has repeatedly asked China to put up resources. Now when China proposes it, the U.S. opposes it. It doesn't make sense. Uh, if we want China to be not just a responsible stakeholder, but a key player in the global economic order, the leadership structure, take on increasing responsibility, this is almost what the doctor ordered in precise terms, and yet when China did it, we opposed, which raised a lot of questions about motivations. Again, we can ask about the details down in the trenches, but I think the big picture question is somewhat along these lines. Now, Sun Yun's paper gave us a very uh, encouraging uh, reconciliation of these different strands when she noted that um, the Chinese original ideas for how to do it were in fact modified substantially by the views of the outsiders. Um, and that suggested, and I think she put it explicitly that way in her paper, that suggested that it's not a clear debate between China attacking the existing order and wanting to revolutionize it versus sticking with the status quo, there's something in the middle, which is China leading some positive, constructive changes in the international order, as David just referred to in a couple of specific cases. So I think we have to keep our eye on the ball. That is the overarching issue, China's increasingly important role in the global economic structure and leadership part of it. Uh, but this very positive note that reconciliation between status quo versus revolutionary change uh, is quite possible, and that, in a way, is the model that I think emerges from this particular debate and is quite encouraging. That leads to my second point uh, about how China, in fact, will run the bank and whether it will meet international best practices. My guess is that China is going to be holier than the Pope. It's a mixed metaphor with the type of government we have in Beijing, uh, but I think they're going to be holier than the Pope. Uh, I think they're going to overdo their meeting of international best practices. Why? First, not because the U.S. or others are pushing them to do it, but because of the markets. The AIIB wants to go out and borrow it's going to get most of its resources from the capital markets of the world, the same way the World Bank, ADB, everybody else does. They're going to have to quell possible concerns in those markets about the potential um, uh, controversy they will raise, pushback they might get from members and non-members alike. And so at least in the early stages, I think they're going to have to be very, very diligent in meeting uh, the criteria and terms of the people for whom they're going to be borrowing tens of billions, if not ultimately hundreds of billions of dollars. So the market discipline, which is not just on P&L and bottom line and rates of return, but goes to these broader issues because they affect the narrow issues, I think it's going to be terribly important. Now, obviously, the views of the uh, member countries from Europe, Australia, et cetera, uh, plus those who may continue for a while at least uh, to a comment from the outside, like U.S. and Japan, all those will be important too. But I do think that the bottom line, because this is China's first big global leadership initiative, and as somebody said, has to be successful, has to be widely perceived as successful, has to be applauded worldwide by markets, by lenders, by borrowing countries, by member states and those on the outside who may at some point hopefully become member states, uh, have to respond to all those constituencies if they did not lean over backward, be holier than the Pope, as I like to put it, uh, I would be very, very surprised. Uh, if they did not go down that course, then even the slightest slip is going to be jumped on by their opponents. And the people who resisted in the first place are going to say, see, we told you so. So they've got to be just super, super careful not to slip even in modest ways. And that's why I would suggest uh, they are going to be holier uh, than the Pope. Um, in fact, I push a little further. Again, David uh, made the points that the AIIB may break some new ground 
and establish some new international best practices. And the fact that the existing institutions are already tilting a little bit in their direction, uh, already evidence of that. But I think they will. Take this most famous issue of whether to have a resident managing board. A lot of criticism. Ah, that means no surveillance, and the Chinese will be able to run rampant and do all sorts of wild things. Well, back when I was running US policy in these areas at the Treasury, it's a long time ago, the president of the World Bank was Bob McNamara, who I think continues to be viewed as the most successful president the World Bank ever had. His greatest bet noir was his <laughs> resident managing board. Now you may say that's true for any CEO, but in the case of McNamara and Ernie Stern, who ran the bank under him day to day, the fact that they had to sit day to day through meetings of all these member countries who commented on the latest irrigation loan to Botswana, uh, that was not a good use of management time. It was not the way to run a railroad. It was not the most efficient mechanism for carrying out the purposes of the institution. And I suspect, and, and uh, Kawai Sun made a very good point in his paper about how the Andean uh, Development uh, uh, Corporation has, uh, has pioneered in that same area with some very positive results. Um, the, uh, I think the AIIB will probably wind up constituting uh, a new international best practice, and it would not shock me that within a decade, these things take a long time, it would not shock me within a decade if some of the existing institutions said, well, mm, that seems to work a little better than what we're doing. Sure would save a lot of time, money, and anxiety. And so uh, let's adopt the AIIB model. Now, that would be a real victory for China. So I hope <laughs> that they do move down that path, demonstrate that what I'm suggesting and David's suggesting turn out to be correct in terms of success. But I would not be surprised at all if we got this new international best practice. Uh, finally, just to revert to an issue I raised at my question to the first group, um, I do have, and it goes back to the first point I made about what really matters here most, matters most, the details obviously do matter, but what matters most is how this fits into the evolution, the inevitable, critical evolution of the global economic architecture, which the accommodation of China within seems to me probably the major issue of the world in some sense. It's certainly the world economy for the next several decades at least. This is an overarching critical strategic question. I certainly hope that what I posited before is not correct, namely that there's an underlying U.S. hostility to all things Chinese now that will color U.S. interpretations of what comes out of China and that um, uh, oppose it almost instinctively. Uh, Matt is obviously right, there are and, and, and uh, uh, Michael as well. There are legitimate questions about any specific initiative, and they need to be addressed, and they need to be seriously thought through, and nothing that comes, it's not true that everything that comes out of Beijing is gonna be right, anything uh, any more than everything that comes out of Washington is right. So I don't mean to say that you just rubber stamp anything that comes out of China. Uh, but if there's an instinctive negative reaction on kind of overall hegemony grounds, world domination grounds, world leadership grounds, I think that would be not only unfortunate, but extremely dangerous. Uh, we're going to have some very big issues coming out on the trade side over the next few years. As soon as the Trans-Pacific Partnership is in place, as now looks like happening fairly soon, thanks, thanks, thanks be, um, as soon as it's in place, there's going to be an immediate question of its expansion because there are a number of APEC countries that want to get in. China has been making noises about maybe wanting to get in or doing the alternative uh, of a free trade area of the Asia Pacific that would be building on the TPP, a separate institution, but the same idea. In other words, an Asia Pacific economic and trade structure that included both China and the United States. That issue is inevitably going to be on the table. And if the U.S. were to respond to that in an instinctively negative way and just kept parroting China's not ready yet, well, then I think we're in for some potentially big difficulties and even U.S.-China confrontation and hostility in the key region of the world. So 
AIIB, I agree with a couple of people who said it's not all that big a deal per se. It was made a big deal by the U.S. reaction. But it may be an important harbinger of things to come. And it may turn out <laughs> that it's been useful to have this uh, uh, blow up of the issue and therefore simulate debates like here today that uh, Sasakawa has, uh, has sponsored in order to force people to think more about what comes next, where the issues may be really big ones and where U.S. policy is going to be really very critically important on this issue that I regard as existential, namely the ability to accommodate China's rise into the global system in a way that avoids the disasters which have occurred from some past efforts to do so with rising powers. And so if this issue can help us go down the path toward uh, uh, constructive so answers to that bigger question, uh, then I think uh, it may all have been well worth it. Okay, that's the end of that. Uh, see if some of the panelists want to say anything you? to other panelists, including me, and then we'll open it up. Can Matt. I just respond to your last point there, Fred? Um, but first, let me just say, on, on, I, I think it is definitely possible that the AIB will uh, you know, turn out to be the gold standard, and I think it is providing a useful sense, source of uh, kind of friendly competition to help everybody do better. So I'm not arguing against that. I just think, you know, there are there are questions. I think in the end, going back to the first point, and the Fred just said again, you know, I think in the end, uh, I have a cute alliterative phrase for this, I think the AIB will turn out to be smaller, slower, and more similar to uh, you know, the ADB and existing institutions than either maybe the Chinese wanted or than, than we feared. So I think all that's true. On your point about, I, I totally agree that the big question, frankly, of our generation, our era, is how we accommodate, you know, um, a, a rising China into the global system. And um, I think that is the $64,000 question here. I, I would say that I don't think the, the U.S. screwed this up, no question. But the, but I do think in the bigger picture, you know, the U.S. has done some things that have, have, you know, led to that sort of greater accommodation, including moving from a G7 to a G20 world. I mean, that was a, admittedly, the plane was crashing and burning and they needed help uh, in 2008, 2009. But I think then the Obama administration made a conscious decision to make the G20 the premier forum for international economic cooperation, uh, which, of which, you know, China was a founding member and uh, will be hosting uh, in the upcoming year. And, and, uh, and then, you know, in the G20, the U.S. championed IMF and World Bank reform, got the World Bank reform through. It may not have been sufficient in some of these specific ways discussed, uh, but I think, uh, you know, it, it's important, I think, in looking at this contextually as well to acknowledge that I don't think the U.S. has been resisting China's rise or has been in this area even, has been overall, um, you know, allergic to the idea of China uh, participating as a as another you know leader in in, in these sort of endeavors. So uh, you know I think this was a this was badly handled, but uh, but and a wake up call in a way that we have to get back on track of accommodating China in this in this uh, type of endeavor in a way that makes them a responsible and not an irresponsible stakeholder. So thanks. Okay, floor is open. Questions right here, over here, and Masa. Yeah, microphone's coming. My name, my name is Kunio Kikuchi, and I'm with Washington Research. But uh, I worked 30 years with the World Bank, uh, starting from the time when Mr. McNamara used to shake hands at Christmas parties. Um, but uh, just to bring back uh, this whole discussion on AIIB and its potential work, uh, it could be two to three times bigger by focusing on infrastructure projects and repeating many uh, continuous uh, sequential infrastructure projects two to three times bigger than the World Bank or AI, uh, ADB, meaning it's not a small business and also because um, only members in the form, the, the AIB will be like the World Bank, it will be a cooperative and only member countries can participate. And it seems that the only major countries that cannot participate in any of this annual 50 to $60 billion of uh, loans 
and projects that AIIB would be involved in would be Japan and United States. And my question is, how long can Japan and United States stay out of that kind of a procurement uh, project business? Thank you. Well, interestingly enough, the articles of agreement say that procurement is open to companies from everywhere in the world. So China's been very clear that Japanese and US companies can uh, compete for contracts and staff will be from any nation in the world. So I'm sure they're gonna hire some Americans and some Japanese staff just as part of rational recruitment. Now, it's easy to say that procurement is open, but if you've worked 30 years in the World Bank, then you know we're, we're going to want to look and see in the end you know, who actually gets the contracts. And I think um, whether or not some Japanese and US firms uh, actually get contracts will be one of the really interesting questions to look at. Yeah, it's very interesting if US firms get contracts anyway, will the US firms lobby the Congress to ever join the bank? Maybe not. Next question over here. Bill Jones from EIR again. Uh, I was taken aback by Matt's comments where you said something, and I don't want to misquote you, that somehow the infrastructure market was saturated and maybe we don't need more. And I, uh, I, I started looking around the world and said, is he really no, living in the I same? Said. I know you didn't mean that. I saw other people who were nodding in agreement, so obviously that's not what you meant. But I, I think it, what you meant is, if, if put in my words, that the world financial situation is such that there really is no possibility or limited possibility for infrastructural investment. Europe is admired in debt. The United States is admired in debt. And in fact, the demand for repayment of that debt is creating a de facto disinvestment. If we look at the countries like Greece, like Italy, like Portugal, there is a disinvestment. Uh, the needs are still there, but the financial uh, logic is demanding repayment of that debt before anything else. It's like Shylock demanding the pound of flesh. Now, what China did, I think, has changed the nature of the game. And the fact that now Japan, as a result of the AIIB, is now putting in $100 billion in investment, that the World Bank is now moving for in, uh, in infrastructural investment. That has changed the directionality. Now, whether or not that will be successful, given the fact that nobody is willing to take, uh, uh, take a, a fight with this uh, debt problem, which must be resolved. If it's not going to kill us, it has to be resolved in some form. Maybe Glass-Steagall will do it. Maybe some kind of a debt conference uh, and a renegotiation of the debt would do it. But something has to be done, because you're either going to be in a situation to try and repay an unpayable amount of debt, or we're going to have a possibility for infrastructural investment. I think what the Chinese want to do is they're pointing the direction the right direction. I think that's in our interest and in others that we move in that. So okay, I th think, th thanks for the question. Yeah. Any, any comments? Well, let me just clarify again, just to Please. be clear. I shook my head, but just to say, I, I didn't say there wasn't an infrastructure need. I mean, I don't know whether it's $5 trillion or $8 trillion or $20 trillion. It's a, it's a trillion. it's a trillion dollar problem. My point was that are there bankable projects that, you know, that, that um, are, you know, that, that require simply new money to, you know, to get them going, or are there some more fundamental issues that are, that are obstacles to infrastructure investment? And I think that's the, that's the question. Okay, Masa. I think uh, one of the fundamental questions uh, is uh, whether we want AIIB to be uh, a uh, high quality bank, just like uh, the World Bank or ADB, or a bank run by developing countries. Uh, therefore, uh, well, in, in the case of the latter, maybe standards, you know, safeguards, uh, maybe weaker. Uh, if uh, developing uh, country members do not want to have a resident board, maybe that, that, that's okay. Uh, so so that, that, that's really the fundamental questions. And, uh, but if uh, 
you know, other members, uh, if, if uh, AIIB wants Japan and the United States to join, perhaps uh, AIIB would have to make, uh, make efforts to be attractive. Uh, a related issue is, uh, uh, say, in the case, well, if uh, uh, environmental social safeguards are uh, we, relatively weak, uh, which we expect, I, I would expect, maybe da David may expect, uh, you know, so, and uh, uh, Fred may expect uh, so, you know, you, you, you said uh, AIIB may set a new global standard. Uh, and the, the meaning of that uh, was, was not so clear, but, uh, but uh, you know, rather than setting up uh, high standards, uh, then, then the question is uh, countries like UK, Germany, and France, they would uh, require high standards from, uh, from the World Bank and ADB. Uh, you know, but at the same time, would they accept lower standards from AIIB in the same country context? David, so, so my, you know, my response to that is, you know, if you look at the clientele in the new AIIB, right, so in any development bank, you've got big countries, small countries, right? Over time, the majority of lending in volume terms is going to go to the big countries. Right. So if this bank is successful, whom is it going to lend to? It's going to lend to India, Indonesia, Philippines. Those are three of the very big economies it's likely to lend to. Those are all democracies with very active civil society, and they all have environmental standards and social standards. Now, one of the complaints you hear about the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank is we, we go into these democratic societies that have rules and regulations, and we say, we don't care about your rules and regulations, basically. If you want a project funded by the World Bank, you actually now have to follow a different set. Sometimes on paper, they're pretty similar, so it's not too onerous, but you know, but frankly, sometimes they're quite different. So I think it's a legitimate argument. If developing countries want to develop their own bank, right, and they're going to lend to big democracies, such as the ones I mentioned, then I, I guess I think it's presumptuous of me you know, to worry that it's not going to meet my standards. Uh, if it meets Indian standards and you've got Indian civil society policing it. I mean, you know, I agree with Fred's point about that they're going to try to be holier than the Pope, as you said, but I think one reason is they're mostly going to be operating in these big democracies. So if you make a misstep in India, civil society is all over you, which I think is a very, very healthy, positive thing. But I don't find that the development banks coming in from the outside with a you know, a different set of standards. Uh, I, I just don't find that particularly useful. Can I just make a quick yeah, two, sure. point, two finger on, on that, just a, a related point that occurred to me. Uh, you know, I, I think there would be a useful uh, role for, say, the G20 to uh, broker a conversation about these standards and what's the sort of, what are best practices? Everybody has different standards, as you said, between the World Bank, even within the, the existing institution, like the World Bank and ADB have different standards. Um, and so I think it would actually be useful to have a, a, a real a forum, a financial stability board for you know, best practices and standards in this sort of lending. Um, and, and China's hosting the G20, so that's a proposal for, for our Chinese uh, colleagues. That's a good idea. Uh, I support what David said. I would add one other point um, on the question of whether this is a bank uh, dominated by developing countries, poor countries. Um, China is still a developing country, and it's going to dominate the bank. So you might say, well, that's a worry uh, along your lines. I am increasingly impressed by how China thinks of itself not only as a developing country, but as a big creditor country. I mean, China's got by far the world's biggest foreign exchange reserves, $4 trillion. I don't think it's quite up to Japan yet as a net creditor country. Uh, Japan's still the world's largest. Uh, Germany may pass it soon with its big surpluses. But uh, China's up there. And if you look at the history of creditor countries through the millennia of mankind, they all think the same way. They want their money back. They're not going to make frivolous loans which are likely to be defaulted upon. And the comments recently about the situation in the Eurozone are 
recent reminders of the risks of doing that. So at least in terms of the economic criteria, it's a little different from the social criteria, though they're related, but in terms of the economic criteria, I would be very surprised if a development bank dominated by China, if it is dominated by China, would have anything other than pretty stringent lending standards with a focus on getting repaid, making a nice return on the lending, again, as I said before, in order to get favorable reactions in the capital markets, which are going to be the providers of the funds. Remember, it's not really the Chinese budget that's providing the funds, let alone the budgets of the UK or Germany. It's the private capital markets. I mean, 20% of the capital, as I understand the AOA, is to be paid in, but 80% is going to be callable capital, and that backs the borrowing in the financial markets. And incidentally, they might have another international best practice in mind, which would be having a little more liberal than one-to-one -one leverage ratio to borrow a little more than the World Bank and the other multilateral banks have traditionally done, which is excessively conservative. So um, uh, I'm a little more optimistic, Master, than you are, both on the social grounds that David mentioned, but fundamentally on the economic and financial grounds that I think the veteran leadership of this new bank, veteran in terms of their own experience in other development banks in the past, uh, will bring to the table. And as I say, if you're a creditor country, you think like a creditor country, and that means you want your money back and you want a good return, and uh, that weighs pretty heavily in your thinking. Uh, there's a question in the back. Uh, Marty Weiss with the U.S. Congressional Research Service. Um, question about, I think a, a successful AIIB would put a lot of uh, support, would give a lot of support to reform elements in the, MD, in the traditional MDBs that are looking for reform of procurement standards, environmental and social safeguards, um, and a lot of these types of reform efforts that are ongoing. What, since the U.S. has been so integral in kind of building up these standards, going back to the Pelosi amendments and pushing back against P4R recently and pushing back on the procurement reform, how does, um, how, how will this kind of proposal further complicate the U.S. relationship with, uh, with the existing MDBs if it's giving more support towards reform efforts that the U.S. has been trying to oppose? David, you want to comment on that? Uh, well, hope the uh, hope the others have something intelligent to say. I guess my, my you know my quick reaction is it's going to create an interesting challenge for the United States from an executive.